Okay, we're back again and we're about to dive into our gas laws. We're going to talk about two gas laws today and actually we're going to sort of put them together and combine it into a third gas law appropriately called the combined gas law. The first law I want to talk about is Boyle's law. And to understand Boyle's law, I want to look at a little bit of data. So first of all, Boyle's law um, relates pressure and the volume of a gas. So if we take a look at this data table here, we have the pressure of a gas given in atmospheres and its volume. Now this is for one gram of oxygen gas at zero Celsius. So the amount of the gas and the temperature of the gas is remaining constant for each of these experiments. Now, you'll notice in the first situation the pressure is 0 0.2500 atmospheres and the volume of that gas is 2.801 liters. In the second situation, I have exactly doubled the pressure. And take a look and see what the volume has done. Hmm. It's gone from essentially 2.8 to 1.4. I've doubled the pressure and the volume has decreased by one half. Now, between the first and the third, I triple the pressure. 0.2500 to 0 0.7500 and the volume goes down by a third. So tripling the pressure reduces the volume by a third. We continue that process and we see uh, similar occurrences until the pressure gets very high. In fact, we can prove that by multiplying pressure and volume together. And we notice that the product of pressure and volume comes out, well, to two significant figures, to be pretty doggone constant. In fact, even at pretty high pressures. So the mathematical relationship between the two variables, V and P, so long as the amount of gas is constant and the temperature remains unchanged, is the product of pressure and volume is a constant. Now I'm going to symbolize constant with the letter K. So P times V equals K. Now, when we start getting to very high pressures and very low temperatures, the relationship is not quite as predictable. And the reason for that is, think about it, what happens at high pressures to a gas and low temperatures? The gas particles start losing kinetic energy, high pressures, we start pushing them together, they start becoming attracted to one another, and they begin to take on liquid properties. So the relationship falls apart at high pressures and low temperatures because the gas begins to behave like a liquid. In fact, if we get the temperatures low enough, or the pressures high enough, or a combination of both, the gas actually condenses into a liquid. Remember, liquid particles have attractive forces. Gas particles, according to the kinetic theory, do not. So, this relationship begins to fall apart under those situations. Now, what we will be dealing with in this chapter are ideal gases. So, we disregard very, very low temperatures and very, very high pressures. We pretend that the gases follow this principle perfectly. In reality, they don't, but we treat them as ideal gases. For the most part, at room conditions, they behave like we like them to. Let's go ahead and graph that data, or take a look at a graph of pressure or volume and pressure relationships. And we can see volume versus pressure. As the pressure of a gas increases, the volume drops. Now you'll notice that's not linear. Sophomores, that means it's not a straight line. It's not perfectly straight. Once again, as uh, pressures increase, um, the uh, uh, the gas begins to take on a few liquid-like properties. Perhaps a better graph would be 1 over volume versus pressure in atmospheres, and we see a nice pretty linear relationship. So, Boyle's Law states the following. Uh, I'm going to squeeze it in up here. For a fixed amount of gas, I'm going to abbreviate amount AMT, at constant temperature, Pressure and volume are inversely related or inversely proportional. Mm. 
Now think about what that means inversely. When one goes up, the other goes down. The mathematical relationship, as we said, is PV equals a constant. We could say that pressure is inversely proportional to volume, and the way we say that is with this symbolism, that's a proportionality sign, 1 over V is inversely proportional. Or, since PV equals K, can't I take the pressure and volume at one situation, and it'll equal the numerical value, shouldn't that equal the pressure and volume at another situation so long as the temperature and the amount of gas are held constant? Now, you might be familiar with this equation, and we are certainly going to put that to use, but I'm going to show you another way to solve Boyle's Law problems besides using this plug and chug method with this P1V1 equals P2V2. Let's take a look at example one from our notes. Here we have a gas that occupies a volume of 12.3 liters. The pressure is 400.0 millimeters of mercury. I'm wondering what the volume of this gas will be when I increase the pressure to 600.0 millimeters of mercury. Now think, what did we just say happens to the volume of a gas when the pressure upon it increases? Pressure increases. Inversely proportional means that if one goes up, the other has to go down. So when I'm all finished, my answer should be smaller than 12.3. So we're going to do it two ways. First, we'll use the plug and chug method, P1V1 equals P2V2. And it looks like we are going to solve for, let's see, what volume will the gas occupy at the new pressure? So we're going to solve for V2. So, wouldn't V2 be equal to P1V1 over P2? Notice I've just divided both sides by P2, so V2 is by itself. So P1, 400.0 millimeters of mercury, times V1, 12.3 liters, divided by P2, 600.0 millimeters of mercury. So, you'll notice that the pressure units divide out, and we're left with our final volume, and that will, of course, be in liters. So, let's see what we end up with here. You know what, I'm going to do this with a really cheap calculator, just to show you that we don't need the expensive one that I used oftentimes. So we have 400.0, and we're going to multiply that by 12.3, and then we'll divide by 600.0. Enter. Looks like we have, my calculator says 8.2, but I believe I'm allowed three significant figures. I have four here, four here, three there, so if it's okay with you, I'm going to call that 8.20 liters. Okay? Now that's one way to do Boyle's Law. I don't necessarily like this way. I like to work it out a different method. I, if I'm solving for volume, I like to begin with the volume that's given. And I simply like to reason the process out in my mind. If pressure is getting bigger, I expect that to get smaller relative to the pressure increase. So I need to multiply this by a fraction. That fraction tells me how much smaller this will get. Now that fraction will include my two pressures. Of course, if I multiply by a fraction, and I want this to get smaller, don't I have to put the smaller number on top? And then, of course, the bigger ones on the bottom. So if I expect this volume to get smaller, which I do because there is an increase in pressure, I'm going to put the smaller number on top. So we can multiply 12.3 times 400 and divide it by 600. You'll notice it's the same mathematical procedure I did up above and I get 8.20 liters. Okay? Now, that's what happened when the pressure increased. What do we expect to happen to the volume of a gas if the pressure were to decrease instead? Well, remember, there's an inverse proportionality. If the pressure drops, I expect the volume to get bigger. So, let's take a look. What would the volume of a gas at, 6, excuse me, at 660 millimeters of mercury be? if the volume were 13.02 cubic centimeters at standard pressure. Now, standard pressure is defined as either one atmosphere, or as you recall, 760 millimeters of mercury. So the volume I'm going to begin with is 13.02 cubic centimeters. Now, that was the volume at standard pressure, at 760. Now, I want to find out what the volume will be 
if the pressure were dropped. So think about this, if pressure goes down, inverse to that would be volume getting bigger. So I'm going to put the bigger number on top because that makes my proportionality or my fraction bigger. So let's see what we get when we multiply this out. We'll clear that out from before and we have 13.02 times 760 divided by 660 and I get 14.99. Looks like I'm only allowed two significant figures so I'm going to say 15 cubic centimeters. Now, if you prefer and you would like to use P1V1 equals P2V2, you may do that and you're going to get the same answer. Let me show you. So, P1 is 760 millimeters of mercury and the volume was 13.02 cubic centimeters. Now I'm solving for V2 again, so I'm going to divide by P2, which is 660 millimeters of mercury. So I have P1 times V1 divided by P2. Notice it's the same operation that I did up above. 760 times 13.02 divided by 660. And once again, I will get 15 cubic centimeters. Now, I don't really care which way you do it. You can use it the plug and chug method or you can reason it out. This requires a little bit of algebra. This just requires a little bit of common sense. Remember, as pressure increases, the volume will decrease. And the opposite is true. As pressure decreases, the volume will increase. That is Boyle's law. Now the pressure unit makes no difference. You can use millimeters of mercury, atmospheres, kilopascals, just make sure the units are the same for both situations and the same is true with volume. The volume units just so long as you're not changing units it doesn't make a difference. That could even be um, liters or if you measured it in quarts or something strange like that the unit doesn't make a difference just so long as they're consistent so that the pressure units divide out or if you're changing uh, volumes the volume units divide out. Okay, we'll wrap that up and we are going to do Charles's Law next. So stay tuned for Charles's Law.